A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Zineb Sadira, whose work in film, photography, installation, sculpture and other media reflects on memory from the personal to the collective and historical as a means of exploring ideas of representation of language and family in intimately informed by her French, Algerian and British identity. By mining her singular autobiography and its complex connection with colonial histories and their contemporary legacies, Zineb has created a body of work that is at once politically nuanced, emotionally complex and visually rich. She was born in 1963 in Paris to Algerian parents and grew up in the high-rise cité of the French capital, which she has described as an enforced ghetto for immigrants from the Maghreb and Africa. In the mid-1980s, she moved to London, where she would be influenced by the black arts movement that was then at its height. In the 1990s, she began her art studies there, first at Central St Martins and then at the Slade School and the Royal College of Art. It was in London that she says she first became particularly interested in post-colonial studies, and this she's explained allowed her to connect in a deep way with her identity and history outside of France and what she described as the pathos relating to Algeria and its colonising country. Some of her earliest works reflect powerfully on family, establishing from the outset her clear conviction that the personal should be political and vice versa. Those works include the photographic piece Mother, Daughter and I from 2003, in which, as the title suggests, Zineb pictured herself with her mother, who was born in Algeria, and with her daughter, who was then growing up in the UK and then pictured them together without her. In each case she captured the relationships in the form of square double portraits and then oval images of their enjoined hands. In a related video, Mother Tongue from 2002, Zineb evokes the diverse experiences of these three generations of her family through language. Their mother tongues are different in each case, her mother's Arabic, her own French and her daughter's English. In the film Mother, Father and I, meanwhile, she even more explicitly uses family to address political and social histories, as her parents tell of their often violent experiences of the Algerian War of Independence. Rather than works of activism, these pieces use personal stories to subtly critique what she calls the politics of memory, and to lend visibility to the kinds of voices and stories that might otherwise be lost. After many years of being unable to visit Algeria, Zineb returned there in 2005, which marked an important shift in her practice. That period of absence was due to the civil war in the country, which prompted the so-called Black Decade, in which, as we'll hear, many intellectuals and cultural figures were killed. Zineb reflected this grim history in her 2018 installation, Laughter in Hell, reflecting on the fate of visual satirists in the Black Decade. Being able to return to Algeria affected the textures and materials of her work, both symbolically and and physically. Her practice always had an archival base, but this tendency has flourished in her work since the mid-2000s. An emblematic work is Image Keepers from 2010, which features an interview with Safia Kouassi, the widow of the Algerian photojournalist Mohamed Kouassi, who was effectively the official photographer of the Algerian revolution of the 1950s and 60s. The two-screen version of this work features both a portrait of Safia in the form of an interview in which she reflects on the nature of memory and preserving her husband's work, and a record of the archives she's preserving, including boxes full of historically important photographs. In this combination of personal testimony and historical documentation, Zineb can, as she puts it, hijack official histories and create a customised archive with a distinctive personal narrative. Among the most compelling works in which she assembles archival material relating to historical events is a series of pieces called Standing Here Wondering Which Way to Go, made in 2019, reflecting on the 1969 Pan-African Festival in Algiers. One element of that work is a huge wall-based assemblage of records, books, objects and photo montages called For a Brief Moment the World Was on Fire and We Have Come Back, presented in the Goodman Gallery in London where we spoke in early February 2024. The piece captures both 
both the surge of cultural activity at that moment and, as we'll hear, a kind of utopian ideal of culture centrality to political revolution. Zineb's most ambitious work to date, in which the combination of the poetic, the personal and the political reach new heights, is Dreams Have No Titles from 2022, first made for the French Pavilion at the Venice Biennale of that year. Presented either as a standalone film or as a multi-room installation with the film at its heart, it interweaves Zineb's autobiography, including a reconstruction of her living room in Brixton in London, with reconstructions of scenes and sets from activist films produced across France, Algeria and Italy in the 1960s and 1970s, a moment of extraordinary promise in avant-garde film. It acts in part as a love letter to cinema, complete with allusions to the artisanal process of filmmaking, as well as its capacity for collaboration, storytelling and political expression. It's a stirring piece in multiple senses, an evocative pion to a golden age of art house film and an impressionistic reflection of Zineb's life and cultural passions. And it returns to that core concern in Zineb's work with which I began our conversation. What lies behind that impulse to explore memory, individual, collective and historical? It seems that they're always in balance in the work just because the strategies I use in my work seems to repeat themselves. And I mean, using different elements each time, hopefully, I hope. For example, more recently, it's been looking at the archive, which is something before I was more into oral history or, or living archives, if you want. So they are more into kind of more traditional archive, i.e. the document archives. Mm. But yes, as you said, always using myself and my family history, uh, so the collective perhaps also, you know, weaved within this kind of larger stories of, you know, of histories. Yeah, absolutely. And But it's, it's crucial that you refer to it as a kind of creative archive in the sense that as an artist, you are still working with existing documents, for instance, but you have a freedom in a way to explore it using different strategies, different creative strategies and so on. I mean, I guess this is the beauty of being an artist is that you don't have to use the archives in the same way than perhaps an academic, an art historian or historian full stop will use. So yes, as an artist, what also interests me in the archive is the visuality or the visual uh, aspect of the archive, the way it looks like, the way it smells, the way the stains are, you know, falls into a page or into a film, the damages perhaps, the, the folders in which it is put in, the, the shelves uh, sometimes. All those aspects are extremely important to me and inform my work and you can see it in the most recent project that I did for the French Pavilion, uh, the, the project called Dreams Have No Titles. I tried to combine a lot of those visual elements from the archive that I do find uh, telling and would tell the stories also. The interesting thing is, though, that you are in some way creating an archive of your own through this process, right? So it doesn't in some way mimic any other archives, but it becomes an archive in itself. And it's loaded again with lived experience and with personal memory, as we were discussing. Yeah, completely. I mean, the idea was to actually transgress or challenge perhaps the traditional archive or the official archive by putting my own aesthetics and my own uh, ideas and, and political stand, if you want, towards it. Because depending on the archive you are researching, it can have perhaps a political kind of stand of its own. So me as an artist, I'm allowed, I guess, I have the freedom, I guess, to actually read between the lines sometime and to analyze it in a different manner, not purely visual, also put my own knowledge. And then the sharing of that knowledge that creates that new archive that I'm creating, as you said, is displayed as for me, I call it the sharing of knowledge as something that I want to share, especially when there are archives who are not easily accessible. And I'm thinking, of course, of the archive of Algeria, because not many people can go to Algeria and are not lucky to access those archives, those archives were full of wonderful documents, you know, whether it's film or press documents or photographic documents. I was lucky at times to be able to access them. And when I came back, because I always came back with uh, tons of uh, <laughs> photographs that I take with my iPhone, 
for me, there was this need of sharing my findings in some mm. ways. And hence why I kind of displayed and, and created this work for a brief moment. The world was uh, on fire, which we can see here at the Guman Gallery upstairs, mm. where I'm using in the photo montage of photo collages I'm making, I'm also putting some of my findings, some of the documents, some of the texts, some of the images that I did find along with this passion that I have of collecting objects, especially vintage objects. And I've realized through collecting and buying very specific books and objects, I'm creating my own archives also, some are perhaps an archive around the Pan-African era of the 60s, but nevertheless, I'm still creating a very specific archive. You've talked about bringing it into the gallery as an act of displacement. I really like that because it again suggests that human activity. Archives are directly related to the human and to human movement. And, and by using that term displaced, it's very evocative of what they can mean in terms of human history and so on. Yeah, and I think archives should be available to everyone and accessible to everyone. But we know the reality of it. It's not the case often because you have to go to a certain places. Sometimes you have to ask authorization to access them, or if not authorization, you still this act of displacement, of them asking to look at an archive. In an art gallery, it's a different context. You know, you actually perhaps make the archive more alive, more accessible, more available. But I like this idea of making the archive, which are often dead documents or old documents, into uh, something which is perhaps more lively, perhaps more colorful also, and it's a way perhaps to give an importance to that archive or, you know, to give it a, a kind of, uh, yeah, an importance, I guess. And there's a wonderful sense of touch that I'm aware of when I'm looking at it in the sense that the record covers are clearly used. You know, you can somebody has, has held this in their hand and, and poured over it and the books are dog-eared or, you know, that sense that objects are connected to bodies in some ways. Yeah, yeah, completely. And and when you think of each of those objects that I buy in flea market or that I buy through auction sales or that I buy through eBay or whatever, I belong to someone before. And sometimes, if I'm lucky, there is a little perhaps text written in the front of the book that tells a lot about the story of that book. So there is a continuing and ongoing story. A lot of the stories I don't know about because I don't know who had those books before, etc. So I think there is, yeah, d definitely they are living objects still, you know, and perhaps after me, after they've been displayed that will perhaps belong to a museum, a collection or a private collector. So it will carry on being passed on from one person to the other. And this idea of multifarious stories links to this idea of mise en abîme, which you use a lot in the work. Obviously, mise en abîme is a, is a kind of visual effect where you have an image of one work which is replicated through the work and goes on forever and so on. But you use that kind of as a metaphor to describe a lot of the ways in which stories are reflected through the work. Yeah, completely. I mean, the mise en abîme is something that I've kind of started working with quite a while ago, probably with a piece called Image Keepers in 2010, where I looked at a photographic archive by an Algerian photographer. And the piece is very complex and very layered, but one of the layers of that piece was about how if you're an artist or a photographer and you deceased, you're not there anymore, what happened to your archive? And of course, I was asking the question about my own archive, what would happen of me when I... So in some ways, I saw myself and I used the photographer Mohamed Kwasi to perhaps talking about this idea of what becomes with the archive, especially when you don't have children or if you have children who might not understand the value of the archive, who might not understand even the work you're doing, you know. So, yeah, so it started there and then it carried on, of course, with the living room of Brixton that I showed for the first time in the Jeu de Paume and I titled Way of Living because it is my way of living, where, you know, it's full of artifacts from the 60s and furniture and, and design and photo of my family, photo of friends in there. And, uh, and again, here you have a, a mise en abîme. And, and for me, the mise en abîme, it's also an element of autobiography that I, you know, I tend to put, or, or personal testimonies of, of stories I tend to put in my work. And when people go to the Whitechapel Gallery to see this exhibition that you have this spring, they will be able to see that living room replicated in the Whitechapel Gallery. I wanted to ask whether when you were assembling that in your life, in your daily life, you had an idea that it was a kind of statement of your identity. When did you realise in a way that it could be used as an installation in its own right? OK, but first of all, I mean, I've been collecting, getting dressed, etc. in that era of times in the 60s and listening music from the age of 18, basically. Mm. So it's been a long time 
more than 40 years, I would say, without giving away my, my age. Uh, <laughs> but yes, when I was working on the uh, Jeu de Pomme project and I had been commissioned this new piece of work, which is called Standing Here, Wondering Which Way to Go, and it was about the Pan-African Festival of 69. I remember I was sitting in my living room with a friend of mine and, and we were kind of bouncing back ideas and where I was at in terms of that project, etc. And at one point, we both said, but look around you. You're working on the 60s, on 69, but all the furniture, everything around you talks about that and talks about Africa because I've got a lot of artifacts that I collect who are African or North African that I have brought back from my trips in the Maghreb region mm. or, or bought in flea markets. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting actually to put, because I wanted to talk about Brixton and the importance of Brixton within the kind of militantism of the 60s. I thought, yeah, so that's it. I've got my kind of London thing or my bricks and thing, let's say, and I'm going to put my living room. And I literally emptied all the furniture and we photographed the walls of my living room. So it became a photographing installation, diorama photographing installation, whereby on the wallpaper you see, on the photographic wallpaper, you see the film posters that I'm, I've collected, the paintings I've collected, etc., etc., or the bookshelves, very important. The shelves were important mm. because there was a lot, a lot of books on postcolonial theory and a lot of books on Algeria. So if you spend a bit of time in my living room at the Whitechapel, for example, and look at the shelf, you will understand that my references were very strongly Algerian postcolonial ideas. And then you see a lot of films also on the shelves and things like that. So it gives you a glimpse of my life, but that life is connected to that Pan-African Festival of 69 somehow. And that Pan-African Festival had as a sort of really core message that culture was central to political life, effectively, that, and indeed life in general. It placed culture at the heart of government, community and so on. Yeah, and also that culture is the way to decolonize oneself. If you think about it, when you've been colonized for 130 years, in the case of Algeria, your identity, your tradition, your, your music, all those things, all that culture has been, oh, in the case of the French, I tried to raise it. Thank God they didn't completely manage it. I think they did a bit manage it in Algeria, if you compare with probably Morocco and Tunisia, mm. but they didn't totally. So for Boumedien, the president of the time in 69, the Algerian president of the time, he understood and wanted to bring culture to the forefront because he was invited all those African countries who were already decolonized, just about to be decolonized or still colonized. Colonized. And there was a sharing between all Africa. I mean, it was a really fantastic and wonderful moment because all those African countries were not able to visit each other at the time, were able to meet each other in one place, in the city of Algiers, in the capital of Algiers, and were able to show each other their tradition, their dancing, their theater, their music, their art, because that festival wasn't just about dancing and music. It was, there was art exhibition, there was film programs, the Algerian state commissioned quite a few films from African filmmakers. There was a theatre, opera, etc., etc. But the Boumedien, the president of the time, decided to not just stick to Africa and to open up to any countries who had a history of imperialism. So you had Vietnam, you have Palestine there, you had Cuba there, you had the Black Panthers coming there, you had all those kind of countries that could talk about some form of imperialism and therefore were all sharing. So it wasn't just, although it was called the Pan-African Festival, it was really not just about that. And there was a famous big symposium that happened also in that August 69, where all the delegation coming from all those countries, even the Arab Emirates were there, the Egyptian were there, etc., etc., were able to give a, a discourse on what culture and imperialism meant to them from their own context and from their own culture also. So I think that was extremely rich. And let's not forget to finish on the... Pan African Festival, that all the liberation movement groups were invited. They didn't have to be African. The Spain was under fascism at the time, yeah. so there was, and also let's not forget the Canary Island were trying to get the independence, so the Spanish were invited. The Portuguese were under fascism, so they were invited also. And then, of course, the Palestinian, and then, you know, and many, many others. So, it, as I said, it didn't just stick to Africa per se. It sounds like an extraordinary event. And one of the things that I'm interested in is if you're dealing with memory and the nature of the past and, and archives and so on, 
how do you locate mood within the work? Because there's interesting discussions about works that relate to archives and nostalgia, for instance. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's a lot of you looking back to look again to the future, right? So tell me about where you would locate mood. Obviously, there are multiple moods, but how do you associate mood with the work? Okay, so I, I would say that the overall mood from the work I've done, whether it was for the Jeu de Paume or for the French Pavilion, it's a joyful mood and it's mm. a celebratory mood. It's about celebrating a certain type of archive and a certain type of event or stories or histories. So this is a mood I'm trying to give to the archive when I can. Yes, and looking back for me, I mean, one might argue that Third World this movement, uh, which was anti-colonial and anti-capitalist, somehow failed. And we all agree that it, in part, I don't think it failed totally because there are some remains from it today still, or some things that have been taken from it. In the case of Algeria, but quite global South countries, I think, can, can vouch for that. But the idea is to still go back. There was some really strong elements in that politics of the time. And I think we need to look back at it to perhaps move better forward. I think because I think there was a path trace for us. And I think it will be silly because I had done the work already before. It'd be silly not to totally ignore it. And I'm not saying everything is valid and valuable today, but there is still a lot of elements from that kind of way of thinking, from that kind of universal or almost global political consciousness that happened at the time, that it's still valid or can still happen today. So as usual, it's about picking what's interesting from the past and leaving out what's not interesting in some ways, yeah. Absolutely. And that celebratory mood is encapsulated in that final line in Dreams Have No Titles, you know, keep on dancing. And, and indeed, there's a text work not far from where we're sitting right now that repeats this idea, dance, you know, it, yeah. it's almost an instruction to your audience. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. I mean, you know, so, you know, to think that because you've been, perhaps this is a bit of a cliche, because thinking that you've been colonized, of course, colonization is terrible. And, and, you know, I can vouch it from being part of that legacy of French colonization and how it affected and how it damaged the country and people's life. But next to that, growing up with my parents who had done the Algerian war as freedom fighters, my parents were always joyful. They never, ever said anything negative about France critical. It's only in my 40s that I actually heard them for the first time, perhaps either crying or talking in a very sad way about what they had lived and who they had lost during right. this uh, And that was in, within the context war. of a work. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. So was, you sort of filmed them and that's the point, point where that happened, I guess. Yeah. Obviously, I knew I was an adult then and uh, I was able to access books and things like that and I knew, but uh, not to the extent in which my parents were involved in that war and how they suffered from it. But as I said, they never, and uh, even to the point that they became very modest about it, if I was saying to my dad, oh, it's amazing you've done that. And my dad was saying, but it's normal. We had to do it. There was no questioning about whether we could or couldn't. We just did it, you know. And I kind of like this kind of generation that kind of lived the war somehow, who almost talks about war in a very factual way, you know, mm. and don't bear grudges to the country that then holds them eventually when they decide to go and live in France. Yes, so perhaps I'm saying something along those lines that, uh, yes, it has happened, but let's keep on dancing. Let's kind of look forward and, and move forward, you know. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests now. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? Okay, so when you ask me this question, the first thing I'm thinking of is when I was at St. Jean Saint Martin in the early 90s. And I remember very much coming across Georgia O'Keeffe and Mary oh. Kelly, the two American feminist artists, one being an installation artist, the other one a painter. And I remember being obsessed with their work for, for a long time. And I guess that led me to my interest in feminism also. Yeah, I mean, it, it, would you say there is a feminist context for your work? It's perhaps less foregrounded in the criticism around your work because so much of that is about post-colonialism and so on. But it seems to me that there is a strong feminist strain through the work. In the early work, definitely. I mean, I was really interested in the female body, you know, and the way it is viewed within Western, I mean, especially the Arab female body, perhaps, well, the way it is viewed within a kind of male-dominated art world. So, yes, it was at the beginning less so now, as you said, because the fact that I'm a woman, I think, 
you know, Pap talks also about the fact that the work can have element, but they're not forefronted in the same way than the way before. Which historical artist do you turn to the most today? I'm thinking of Turner when you say that. Turner, because when I'm a bit sad or when I'm in that kind of uh, mood space where I'm not sure where I'm going in terms of my work or whatever, and also because I've done a lot of work on the sea and immigration and that space between France and Algeria, that Mediterranean mm. space between the two countries, Turner. Turner, for me, I can spend quite a long time looking at the painting and let myself go in so many different spaces. And, and I will go back and go back and see Turner. And, of course, there's a very traumatic painting by Turner, which is, it seems to me, only growing in importance today because so many artists are, are turning to it. And actually, you turned to it 10 years ago in Guiding Light, which was the slave ship painting. Why did you turn to that work and how did you use it? I mean, because for me, it was about immigration of some sort or, or mobility. And in the work you mentioned, Guiding Light, I was looking at the desert, that space that divides sub saharan Africa with North Africa, and which is a very important and difficult space for sub saharan African who are trying to go to Europe. They've got two big spaces, vast spaces that they have to, to cross over. It's the desert, the first one, and then the sea. So I was making an interesting, I hope, analogy between the sand and the desert and the sea in some ways. Absolutely. And of course, the harrowing thing about slave ship is that Turner was an abolitionist and he was making an anti-slavery point. But still, I think for many viewers today, it has that incredible kind of almost physical impact when you view it and you really think about what it's depicting as a slave ship throwing enslaved people overboard. Yeah, and it, there is so much drama in his, uh, not just only through the, the lighting, but as, as you mentioned with that uh, particular painting, there is so much drama and I think I, I kind of quite like the drama of it, yet with some very kind of uh, powerful colour palettes and, and lighting, you know. So I don't know, there's something that draws me into those paintings, slightly dark too, so it's got that kind of contradiction perhaps for me, but perhaps because I'm quite somebody joyful, perhaps I need sometimes to look at things who brings me back to earth and brings me back to reality. And, and then of course there's floating coffins, which it seems to me relates very closely to Turner in the sense there are the, it's this extraordinary sort of graveyard for ships effectively. Tell us more about it, but it, it's when I see those images i think about turner's fighting temeraire and this ship that's dying you know and 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 you somehow projected that into a contemporary space in a way yeah, I mean, the floating coffin piece, it's a, it's a, like multi-layered because it's talking about immigration, it's talking uh, at colonization because Mauritania, it was shot in Mauritania and Mauritania was colonized by the French. It's talking about immigratory birds uh, because that place in Mauritania, which is a town called Nouadhibou, is known for also is bird watching. So I was trying to make some analogies between those three elements about also what I call the death of a journey. So the boat not traveling anymore, not moving anymore. Those birds arriving from Europe to Africa. And then the next one was, of course, uh, to Sub-Saharan African, mainly uh, Senegalese, trying to escape to Europe via Nouadhibou because North Africa is almost impossible for them now. Mm. So, of course, I didn't want, and I never do film people because I don't think ethically it's right to film people uh, without asking uh, them. And I don't think it's right in any case to make some kind of living from other people's lives. So I use often metaphors and, and poetical images. And the boats, for me, were perhaps the one that were talking more about this situation, or is this awful situation, and also talking about the economy and also the state of Mauritania and how corrupted and also how poor it is and how it has to accept or it does accept money from all those ship landlords who don't want to go and, and dismantle the boat because it's too expensive and drop them for very too little money, dump them in some ways in Mauritania. And as usual, Africa becomes a big bin or dumping side for whatever Europe doesn't want anymore. So it was, it was interesting there in the sense that you're drawing together the sort of intersectional effects of climate change and migratory peoples and so on, it, it, how everything is so bound up in some way. Yeah, yeah, and, and this idea of recycling within the kind of the environmental issues that the work was bringing, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a series of works that you made relating to sugar, again, in relation to slavery, which it mm -hmm. seems to me are really powerful works. And I would say that they also reflect your diversity 
of means, the way that you can involve sculpture, photography, mm -hmm. film and so on. And, and that's Sugar Roots, Sugar Surfaces, Sugar Silo, which was made in Marseille. Is that yeah. right? Tell us more about yeah. that. So uh, that was a piece that was commissioned in 2013 by the port of Marseille and the city of Marseille because uh, Marseille was capital of Europe, whatever they call it. Oh, yes, you know, yeah, right? the sort of capital culture. Yeah, yes, culture, yeah. yeah. And I was commissioned, and the port wanted to work with me, and I guess they wanted me probably to do something, because we always say the port of Marseille is the sister city of Algiers, mm -hmm. uh, being on the other side. But I didn't want to look at Algeria again. Okay. Uh, so I, I kind of visited, you know, the port and, and find those sugar silos, amazing, uh, very powerful, especially when I find out where the sugar was coming from and, and the different color of the cane sugar according to the place they were coming. There was different shade of browns. Mm. You know, naively, I thought cane sugar has only one color, but no, it can go from very dark to very, very light. And I thought that was quite also interesting in terms of the metaphor for the color of, of skin for slavery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of amazing to see tons and tons of sugar in front of you. Like it becomes almost like mountains with this stratification as the sugar is taken away by those lorries and, and create some kind of marking on the walls and on the pile of sugar itself. Uh, so I thought there was a lot of interesting stuff going on, uh, looking at geopolitics also, not only with the sea, but also with the earth or with, you know, so I was making perhaps some kind of connection with also the earth and the sugar and territories and the sea. Which contemporary artist do you most admire? Whoa, so this always is a very difficult one, and I might not respond to this one with a name. <laughs> I'm often asked this question, and I'm always stuck with it, because there are so many artists that I respect. Sometimes I don't necessarily love their work or all their work, but I like them for their warmth, humanity. There is a generation of artists, I believe, which I think slightly older than me. And I'm thinking of people like Alfredo Jarre, Mona Hatoum, people like that who have, first of all, wonderful work, political work. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm interested in artists who tend to be political in their work, but who have also generosity about them. This kind of capacity of sharing and giving that perhaps I would say younger artists don't have. But as I said, you know, I don't like always all their work. And, and there are so many, there are a wealth of other artists. So I'll be spending like 10 minutes listing all the ones that I'm looking at. <laughs> I think for me, the, the main thing is that if they're political, sometimes if I connect to them or not, on the work level, on the content level. And after I'm lucky now at the stage I am in that to know some of them and to meet them and to value very much the way they are as people, you know, as artists. I think one of the things that you have in common with Mona Hatoum and Alfredo Jar is that all of you are contending with political issues and finding ways to translate political issues into a statement which is, on the one hand, accessible to somebody who may not know the background to that situation, but also doesn't oversimplify it so that it becomes didactic. So do you wrestle with that? Is that something which is hard to come by, if you like? No, I don't wrestle with that. I think it's part of the way I make work. For me, uh, poetry and metaphors are very important in the work. And I think Alfredo Jarre uses that also, although perhaps he's a bit more directly political than I am, I would mm -hmm. say. I think, again, it depends on the work. You know, it's very difficult to generalise. The affinity, I think, it's definitely because we are into social issue and political issue, and we all do it in that kind of way, which is, I would say, opens up or is universal, opens up in the sense that you can come from a different background from where the story is, but still read something that will touch you. And that's perhaps this kind of idea of broadening the work to make it accessible to others which is very interesting for me. That doesn't mean that I don't respect artists who are more activists. I think it's great. I respect a lot, and I love quite a few of them too. But this is not my strategy when I want to dialogue with an audience. I want to be more open and less, as you said, didactic perhaps, or less pointing finger. I like the idea of letting the audience to make their own understanding of the work, if, if you want. Right. Uh, and obviously, depending on the context where the work is showing, I can see the difference when my work is shown in Algeria or in Africa, as opposed to the US, perhaps, or, or Sweden, you know. Right. Uh, and that's what's interesting, and that's why I feel it needs to be a bit open, because every story, even if you are not being colonized, 
you have become often the colonizer. So you have the story of the colonization in any case yeah. in your life. And therefore you will connect to the work, whether you are on one side or the other. Right. You know. and, and that you said something very nice, which was that it's a political act to use and to question what we inherited. Yes, of course it is. I mean, I believe we always have to question what's been given to us, whatever the level of questioning is, you know. There's a really powerful work that you made called Laughter in Hell, which works with a very particular kind of contemporary artist, mm -hmm. which is a cartoonist. And it's a work which is concerned with the Black Decade. Can you explain a little about the Black Decade and why you wanted to make this work about cartoonists? Okay, I started going back to that work, Image Keepers. I started looking at how culture is used as a tool or as a weapon to fight or to resist a conflict. That led me to looking at laughter and humor and how that was used in Algeria to fight the rise on Islamist terrorism that mm -hmm. happened in Algeria for a good 10 years. That rise of terrorism came after the 5th of October, 88 riots that happened in Algeria, a bit like the Arab Spring. People, you know, kind of uh, march in the streets, some were killed, blah, blah, blah. So at the time, the government, which is a state government and with a unique party, so decided for the first time in the history of Algeria to open up to a democratic voting to elect the next president. That was in 91, this election. But before that, the state of Algeria opened up to freedom of speech and to freedom of press. So suddenly there was a rise of, from two, I think, state newspapers, three state newspapers, suddenly there was hundreds of them. Right. And a lot of them were also French, but also in Arabic. And a lot of them were actually based to the left, I guess, politically, and were talking very freely about what was happening in Algeria. So that was something that we gained in Algeria, which was amazing. So we're talking about 89, 90. So then many, many journalists to come post in those newspapers. And then a lot of caricatures of newspapers understood they needed also uh, some people to do some drawings. We didn't have really a lot of caricaturists because there isn't a school of that. But, you know, a few people were coming out from the art school, from L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, etc., put their hand into making some political drawings for those newspapers. And in 91 happened the election. The first round goes to the FIS, which is uh, the Islamic Front Party. And before the second round happens, the state of Algeria is faced with a situation, what do we do? Do we really, we said we were going to do a democratic election. Do we let the second round happen? And if it does happen and they win, this is it. We are then under Sharia law. So we, a bit in the model of what's happening in Iran somehow. Mm -hmm. So they were faced with this idea, or do we stop it? And they decided to stop it. And one might argue it's not right, other might argue that, but yeah, but otherwise we'll be at the moment under an Islamic state, and that's not what we wanted. Anyway, so from that, those Islamic groups were not happy because, yes, it wasn't democratic to have stopped this election. Anyway, so there was another group, which is an arm uh, Islamic group called the Jaya, who actually started killing and terrorizing the people, not only killing the army and the police, but also the people, the civilians. And that was awful. So the caricaturists and the newspapers, because they had freedom of speech, they were able to talk about them like they were able to talk about the failure of the politics of the time, of the state. So there was a wealth of political drawer who came into that period. And so the humor was very sharp. It was very self-deprecating, obviously. And along that, along the press caricature and drawing that were made, there was also a lot of oral jokes that were going around. And when I started going back to Algeria post-2000, after the Black Decade had finished, I would go to bars and restaurants or at dinners at France, and people would tell jokes about what had happened during the Black Decades in a way that was, first of all, hilarious, really funny, very clever, with play on words and whatever. And I started collecting them. Literally, each time I'll come back in the evening, I'll really write down the stories and I made a little book with those oral histories. Mm -hmm. But then I also started looking at the archives. So I went to some archives and look at all the press from the time. Nothing is digitalized, so I literally had to go physically and look at pages and pages. And I realized there was something like 85, I think I did, uh, in that piece of a cluster in hell, I did also a list of all the caricatures that existed at the time, and there was something like 85 of them. Managed to photograph of a lot of the drawings, all in French, mainly few in Arabic, but mainly French. And let's not forget that one of the things that happened during this black decade is that a lot of intellectual people from culture and journalists and caricaturists were killed by this armed group. And it was awful because... Uh, 
a large part of the intelligentsia of Algeria of the time left flee because they got some death threats, flee to France or other places, and others were killed. So anyway, I wanted them to look at humor and jokes as a political act of resistance and fight, and a way of disseminating also what was happening because the main core of the killing and the massacres were happening in the north of Algeria. So if you were in the south, you didn't know, but you could buy the El Watan newspapers or Liberté newspaper, and through the articles and through the drawings, you could also understand what was going on somewhere else. It's really extraordinary. So in a way, that piece is a kind of a celebration of these artists and that spirit, but also it's a kind of memorialization of what happened. Is that right? Of course. And within the piece, I collected all the books that were made out of those caricatures. I spoke and met a lot of those caricatures because, thank God, it's still alive. You know, it's not. I commissioned two of those caricatures that were drawing in those newspaper. I give them a list of oral jokes each from the time, and I asked them to draw them. So they made two different sheets of caricatures. So there was a wealth of books on display. There was a film recording with a, a journalist called Mustafa Ben Fodil, who writes for El Watan, who lived through the 90s and could talk about a lot about that whole energy that was happening at the time with the caricature and with the humor. There was an American, Elizabeth Perigo, who was an academic who was in Algeria and was researching exactly my subject and is more academic, so kind of analyze it in a much better way than I do <laughs> here. But, you know, she does also speak in an interview that I put in the film. So it, it's a difficult project because it's mainly French because a lot of the books mm. and caricatures were French. What was interesting, I started in 2012, 13, in two 2015, we've got the attack in France on uh, Charlie Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo. So I had to pause because for me, it was so scary. It was like a déjà vu. And that also told me how important it was to talk about that because they were exactly living the same situation somehow. And actually, just after the Charlie Hebdo attack, there was a focus on Algerian caricature because they realized that Algeria had gone through that had done drawings about that. So suddenly you had all those unknown caricatures that nobody looked at because they were Algerian and nobody cared, were invited suddenly in seminars and talk or even to contribute in Charlie Hebdo, their own story of Algeria. And then I paused it for a year or two and then decided to resume it after when I um, showed it at the Charger Art Foundation exhibition. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 350 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Recent additions to the app include the Japan Society in New York and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. Among the guides on Bloomberg Connects are several UK institutions where Zineb Zadira has shown her work, including the Whitechapel Gallery, where she has her exhibition Dreams Have No Titles between February and May of 2024, and Dundee Contemporary Arts, or DCA, where she had an important solo exhibition in 2023. If you download the guide to the DCA, you can explore the current exhibition at the gallery, Our Mountains Are Painted on Glass by Michelle Williams Gamaker, with a video walkthrough of the show and audio content about the works. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. What do you have pinned to the studio wall? Pinned to the studio wall, a lot of my uh, film posters collection, mainly from the 50s, 60s, some Egyptian ones, but not only. I do a lot of collages and photomontages at the moment, so you'll find a lot of strips of <laughs> things that I'm combining there. But yes, yeah, mainly my stuff, really, not really uh, other artist stuff. <laughs> Tons also of uh, canisters of films, you know, lying around, you know ready to be used at one point. I love the canisters of films that are actually part of your, they're sculptures within your work, and now this new strand, which is these film canisters sort of cast in resin, so they become sort of ghosts of film canisters. Tell us more about those. Well, yes, I mean, you know, I spent so much time in films archives where I saw tons and tons of film canisters, often rusty or, or damaged or, or used, you know, aged. And I do find them beautiful. Like always, I'm always being attracted by the rust, by the ruins, 
But nowadays, in, in film archive, in proper film archive, in serious film archives, I should say, they don't use those canisters anymore because they damage the emulsion ah. of the analog. So they put them into those ugly plastic <laughs> boxes. So they throw away the old ones, and then I, I go in the bins and get them, <laughs> get them. You know, no, I was given by the cinematic Francaise and Sensi hundred and hundred of canisters, yeah, that mm. they can't use anymore because finally they realize that it, it wasn't good to the films. Interesting. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? Oh, that's again a difficult one for me. I mean, it's not so much the museum that I visit, it's the, uh, the exhibition that I visit. Mm. Well, of course, there are some perhaps uh, museums who have perhaps a, a program that's a bit more interesting. For me, it would be Camden Art Centre, perhaps the White Chapel or South London Gallery. Mm. But really, what takes me to an exhibition or to a museum, it's the exhibition itself. So it could be any places. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? My parents' culture, the Algerian culture, I think. Spending time in Algeria, spending my childhood in Algeria on holiday, and later on as an adult, as an artist also, my relationship to the art world there and the art community. Because when you're lucky enough, and because I do think it's lucky to come from two or three identities where all let's not say opposite to each other, but we're quite different from each other. One being the colonizer, let's say, to be simplistic again, and the other one colonized. Those two, when they put together, and it's a bit me somehow, it feels almost like I'm complete. Or I've got both angles or visions. I often think when people talk to me about politics on the radio, for example, or where they get the news from, I always say, I always listen to the French news, the British news, and the Algerian news. And then after, I feel like I've got a better view and understanding of what's happening, because of course what will be told in Algeria will be very different from France, and from France to England also, although the difference is perhaps not as big still. So somehow it gives me much more comprehensible, do you say that in yeah, English? Yeah. Understanding perhaps of some issues. You've talked about how important that visit to Algeria for the first time in 2005, after having not been since 1988, was to your practice. It literally completely changed the way you work by the sounds of it. Yes, because for the first time I was able to work on, on colonisation, on French colonisation, by being in Algeria. And before I was doing it via my parents' history and stories... And my knowledge of it in France, which was very little, because when you think I grew up in France, when at school in the history classes, you were told that the war of Algeria was only an event. It was called an event. Suddenly, I think in the late 90s that it would change into a war. Mm. So my knowledge of that became developed when I came in the UK yeah. by doing, you know, post-colonial studies, but then later on by going to Algeria. So instead of doing work with my parents... I was then doing work in Algeria, in the city, with the people I was surrounded. And their relationship to that colonization was also different because often I was meeting intellectual artists. The way they were talking about it was, again, different from the way my parents were talking about it. We're from another generation mm. where people who are not cultivated in the sense that ne never went to school, whether it's French or Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, so the knowledge of the history was much more from the heart, if you want, as when I was in Algeria, I was able to talk to people about it in a much more kind of intellectual way. And a friend of mine who came to Algeria said to me, for the first time I understood what post-colonial is, it's when I set my foot in Algeria. Because you have this amazing dichotomy between the architecture, which is French, the people who are Algerian, but within the language, it's a mixture of Algerian and French and Berber. You have this kind of multitude of mixes that happen. One might hate the fact that the you know, Algiers is so French in terms of its architecture, but I do feel it's actually something that we have to cel not celebrate, obviously, but something that we have now to accept as part of the Algerian heritage, you know. Which writers or poets do you return to? Oh, that's again another difficult one, and I won't, I won't give you any specific name. A lot of the reading I do today, unfortunately, are based on research. Mm -hmm. So I don't read fiction so much. It all connects with what I'm working on at the moment. So if it's about Algerian cinema or third world cinema, that's the reading I'm going to do. And it could be some reading on the internet, like books that I buy. I buy a lot of books. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see in my installation, I put books also. So I try to read them or actually read part of it before I, I put them on display. So no, I don't have any specific names really to give you. <laughs> but nonetheless, as you say, they're, they're bound up in the work. There's a section in the film, Dreams Have No Titles, in which 
which clearly there is a figure reading Franz Fanon's yeah. A Dying Colonialism. And also I know that you use Aimé César's quote about a people without a memory or a people without a future, mm-hmm. almost as this kind of light motif running through the work. So in a way, the literature of post-colonialism is sort of writ through the work in some way. It's completely way. that. I mean, literally what I'm reading at the moment or oh, for the last 10 years has been very much that. I mean, sometimes interacted with one or two fiction all books that I read a long time ago and I want to re accustomize myself. For example, recently I read The Camus L'Etranger, yeah. The Camus, because, you know, there was so much polemic around the writer Camus in terms of his relationship to Algeria. There was a lot of controversy, or today there is controversy about the book. So every now and then I jump into an old book that I read a long time ago, but might have forgotten about it. And I do the same with films. Sometimes I go back to old films because I think with age, as you mature, as an artist, as you do research, perhaps your ideas might change. So I think it'd be quite interesting to revisit. What music or other audio do you listen to while working? Okay, so music, I'm really, really into jazz. I'm really, really into ska. So it's all what we call Studio One music or Rocksteady music. So that kind of uh, reggae from the 60s. Blues, rhythm and blues, all those mm-hmm. old music. That doesn't mean I don't listen sometimes to more modern music, but often this modern music will be influenced by the music I just mentioned. Right, yeah. You mention it, don't you, in Dreams Have No Titles. There's a lovely flow through the work of your voiceover, effectively giving an impressionistic guide in sense to your life and your influences and your references. And there's a bit where you talk about rock steady and acid jazz and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And, and the, the starting music that you enter, it's kind of rhythm and blues, uh, ska kind of tune. And I would have used far more music if it was easier to get rights to use music in films, because that can be quite a problem. In terms of uh, radio, I listen to a lot of podcasts. At the moment, I'm very, very keen on postcard. And that's part of me being lazy when I can't read a book. <laughs> I will actually put a postcard. For example, I will put a postcard of Simone de Beauvoir because uh-huh. I read some Simone de Beauvoir a long time ago. So, of Franz Fanon, one, another postcard on civil rights movement in African American culture. So, I listen to a lot of podcasts like that. For me, it's, I think it's a wonderful way to get into understanding perhaps or revisit a story or a moment in time via listening rather than reading. You mentioned earlier on the title, Standing Here, Wondering Which Way to Go, which relates, of course, to the Pan-African Festival. Mm. And that's a Marion Williams performance. Yes. Was it just those words that were so symbolic? Or was there something in that performance that caught you so much that you wanted to give that title to the work? First of all, she was at the Pan-African Festival. Yeah. She did a performance there. And then when I read the title, I thought, what a wonderful title. I feel like that all the time in my life, you know, wondering where to go, you know, standing in front of my work and wondering where to take it, you know. Of course, it's very uh, proper to that 60s period of time because I think she's talking about politics and race politics, perhaps Mm -hmm. more particularly. But yes, I was interested in all those protesting songs and you can see the collection upstairs here at the Goodman Gallery. All those songs were politicals. So for me, it was like a wonderful title for the project because it really said here in 1969 in Algeria, all standing together but where do we go from there and she also in a way summarizes that point that you made earlier on about it being pan-african in the broadest sense in you know in terms of the african diaspora she marion williams is an Mm african-american singer so i suppose also that encapsulates that the breadth of influence of that of that event in some ways yeah 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 and and there was actually a lot of african-american artists uh, invited Funny enough, I don't know why that focus on African-American, but there was a lot of African... I mean, we're talking about Nina Simone, we're talking mm. about Archie Shep and many other singers that came and performed there. And then there's a, a Nina Simone record in the display above us where we're talking yeah, now. Which Ma- is- Marion Williams, of, I think, is also upstairs. So mm. depending on the iteration of the work... You know, because I collect and, and some of those vinyls now are collector's item. I don't always find them, but when I find them, I try to put them in the exhibition in the work. At this point, I normally ask what other media influence your work. And of course, it's film. 
(laughs) So let's talk a bit about film. In Dreams Have No Titles, you reference very specific moments in several films. What was it that made you pick those out in particular? Because that was a tremendous flowering in terms of avant-garde cinema, in terms of cinema that was absolutely about resistance and liberation and so on. But you've chosen some very particular moments. Yeah, I've chosen the moment that are collaboration between Algerian Italy and Algerian France. And the reason for that, I think, is quite obvious. Italy, because I was showing in Venice, and there is a film festival of Venice, which is a very important, also an important political hub at one point, anyway, in the 60s, for sure. And then France, because I'm French, and Algerian, because I'm Algerian. And also because I knew, through the Jeu de Pomme project, that there was a wealth of collaboration that had happened in the 60s and 70s with those two countries, with many other countries, too, but... For this project, I decided to concentrate on that triangle of Algeria, France, and Italy. And then I picked, I did a, a list of all, and there was far more than the one I used. But then after, you know, it's to do with rights of using, because when you do remakes of uh, films, you have to ask authorization to do it. It's easier somehow to get a clip and include it in your film than when you make a remake. Right. So I did shot far more, actually, uh, scenes, but the authorization didn't come through. I wasn't allowed to use them, so I didn't. So I kept to the Battle of Alger, I think Le Bal, L'Etranger de Visconti, and I can't remember the other ones. Yeah, so that's why I ended up choosing the one that I was allowed to choose, but also the one that had a political component to them, because, of course, Algeria also did some collaboration with Italy, for example, on films that were less political, you know. Mm -hmm. But as a whole, all of them had a kind of anti-colonial component to them, because that was a bit what Algeria wanted to fund, this type of film, because it was part of what they were trying to develop, this kind of anti-colonial, anti-capitalist somehow ideas. Yeah, I use those films, plus a film that disappeared called Les Mains Libres and got restored thanks to me finding it in a small archive in Rome. I approached the Cinematheque of Bologna and asked them whether they would restore it. They said yes. So an Italian filmmaker, the film totally financed by Algeria. And so the film got restored now is available. Nobody could see it for 57 years exactly, because the last time it was seen, I think it was in 65. So now it's readily available. People can contact Cinematheque of Bologna and show it. It's a very also important film to talk about post-colonial Algeria. So in that sense, I thought uh, it needed to be restored and it needed to be uh, seen. And I weave that film. In the case of Les Mains Libre, I actually take clips and put it in my film. That's great. Uh, so it's about my love of cinema, of my love of, of radical cinema or political cinema, but it's also about the making of the film because you have a lot of making of. Within. It's about also friendship. It's about the crew being part of the acting, being in the film, as well as my family and friends, or what I call my artistic community, to be in the film. So it's a mishmash of somehow my life, perhaps, yeah. Yeah. My God, that sounds so kind of uh, <laughs> self-centered. <laughs> no, it, 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 no, it absolutely does come across as that. It's a love letter to cinema, but it's also a, it's, it's a very autobiographic work, yeah. Yeah, it's also a love letter, perhaps, to my art community and, mm. and the strength and the support that I get, and I hope they get also from me, but I definitely get from them, you know. And that community is all over the world. It's not just in London or just in Paris, you know, Mm. because we... We're lucky as artists, we exhibit in so many places and we meet people, we have discussion with people from various backgrounds, you know, whether it's class, whether it's culture, language, and all that informs my work all the time, all those meetings, those discussions, those those friendships, those Mm -hmm. solidarities somehow, yeah. And there's this wonderful element that people will see should they go to the Whitechapel, which is that... With Le Bal, the film from 1983, which is a dance-based film, there is no dialogue, they will see almost a hallucination of that film in the form of performers dancing. So, I mean, obviously there are reasons why you chose the others, but why did you choose to reanimate, if you like, that film? Well, Le Bal, I chose, uh, I think it's a political film. The scene I chose was a scene where there was one Algerian actor in the film, and I decided to use the scene where he does this very funny dance. It's a very funny film. It's a Mm. political film, but very funny. And again, I was interested in this idea of of laughter and humor and joy, which I think this film has throughout the two hours of dancing. And also a lot of people were saying that I looked like the lady that was (laughs) dancing with this Algerian actor. And so I decided to uh, reenact 
this scene with a very good friend of mine, Faisal Bakrich, who's also an artist and who's also a French Algerian. And we did it. But it was about self-deprecation also. Because for me, okay, the film is very much about me. Okay, yes. And I'm a bit embarrassed as I say <laughs> that. But it's also about laughing at myself. It's serious, but it's also me saying, you know, let's laugh at oneself, you know, let's move on. You know, it's part of life, you know. Even today, when I watch it, after watching it like 50 times, perhaps, I'm, I'm laughing so much because <laughs> it's like just God, the face of my friend and my face and, and, and all that. It's just wonderful, wonderful. With next to that, the making of, you know, you, have, you see the kind of the camera moving in with the crew. They're very serious, yeah. you know, trying to not make any noise and all that. And here we are, us, you know, dancing very badly, that tango and making, putting faces but of course, it all makes sense in the film. And as I said, Le Bal was a co-production with Italy, Algeria and France. Actually, a co-production between the three countries. Amazing. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? Oh, I mean, I don't know if I would call it a discipline, but a ritual, perhaps. I wake up, the first thing I do, coffee. Café. Café noir. Uh, black coffee with my Italian coffee machine. Very particular. I need to make it. I need to have the physical element of making that coffee, then the smell of the coffee. And then after that, radio. So if I'm in London, it might be BBC London radio, depending on the time, because sometimes I like better than others uh, what's on the radio. Sometimes it's uh, France Inter, France Culture, and other time it's podcast, depending on my mood. So the radio has to happen at the same time that I make work. There needs to be some kind of music or talking happening there. I always ask about the rituals, whether they are used as a way to facilitate the work or as a way to separate oneself from the work, if you like. So when you're making that coffee, is the work in your mind or are you just focusing on waking up beforehand? It's almost like a yeah. preamble. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the making of the coffee is definitely to wake up. The <laughs> drinking of the coffee, nevertheless, is while I'm making work. So it's part of that. And there will be not one coffee. There might be two or three coffees, yeah, during the day. And radio music, it's important. Keep on dancing. Yeah, keep on, I might even be sometimes dancing a little bit, you know, and then, you know, making work or whatever, yeah. I love it. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? My dream will be, but it's too expensive. I wish I had bought it 20 years ago. Assume you it's, can afford it. Yeah. It's from a modern artist, a female artist, Algerian artist called Baya. She's um, showing a lot at the moment. People mm. kind of have discovered her work about the last 10 years, I think. So she's everywhere. And I love her work for the simplicity of it. She's a painter. So for the simplicity, the naivety about it, but the joy and the colours and the life of it. So I wish I had bought a Baya 20 years ago when nobody knew about her, nobody cared. But now it's like just not possible. But I can always have a a copy of a painting on my walls. Indeed you can. And lastly, what is art for? For me, it's for resisting. Resisting so many things. Loss of memory, ageing, love or unlove. Perhaps there is another word on resisting, which is less associated to political. For me, resisting is not just about politics. It's about the everyday things you do in life. Resisting paying your bills, I'm thinking of, you know. Yeah, it's also an act of... Again, I'm going to use the word politic, but I think it's a bit too strong in that context. But it's an act of being, of seeing and saying, you know. I mean, I couldn't live without it. So I think for me, it's essential to my life. I don't know, I'm becoming a bit soapy now. So <laughs> Not at all. There. Zineb, thank you so much. Thank you. Zineb Sadira, Dreams Have No Titles, is at the Whitechapel Gallery in London from the 15th of February to the 12th of May. The film version of the work is on display at Tate Britain until September of this year. And Dreams Have No Titles will be shown at the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates from the 3rd of October to the 28th of January 2025. Zineb's exhibition Let's Go On Singing is at the Goodman Gallery in London until the 16th of March. And the work Standing Here Wondering Which Way To Go will be on show at the Kaluskal Bay. Benkian Museum in Lisbon in Portugal next year from the 19th of June to the 22nd of September. 
And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. Production, editing, and sound design on a brush with are by David Clack, and the producer is Louis Jeb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to Zineb Sadira. See you next week. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.